But hey, before we jump into the message, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for this opportunity to share the word that you have placed on the inside of my heart. And God, I pray that as I communicate here today, I pray that I would get out of the way so that way your Holy Spirit can speak directly to each and every one of us. And so God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, go ahead and you may have a seat Again, thanks for being here as we are in our At The Movies series. How many of you guys have never heard a message during our At The Movies series? Anybody here who hasn't heard one yet? Maybe you're tuning in online. And uh, man, this is, I love I love this series. It's so much fun to be able to to preach the gospel as we take something that is timely. We're talking about different movies that a lot of people have seen or at least heard about, and we're taking those movies to tell the timeless truths that are found in God's Word. And so each week we have a a different theme, a different movie that we're going to be talking about, but really the important part that we're communicating during this series is all throughout the summer we're going to be talking about the armor of God. The armor of God is something that we can read in Ephesians chapter 6, and, uh, and we're going to get to that here in just a moment. But we decided to kick off this series uh, with one of the greatest series of all times. It is a classic, Rocky. And uh, how many of you guys have seen all of the Rocky movies? Now, if you, if you missed like the Creed movies, that doesn't count. Anyway, that's not a Rocky movie. That's not a good Rocky movie. If you saw the, the classics, you know, one through five, those are the good. Am I right, Stacy? All right, there we go. Stacy is our resident expert on all things Rocky. And so if you have any questions, just talk to Stacy McNutt. And, uh, and so one through five, those are the best of the Rocky movies. On a count of three, go ahead and just shout out your favorite Rocky movie. One, two, three. If you said anything other than four, your opinion is wrong. (laughs) But we're in church, so we'll forgive you this time. Um, So although four is the greatest Rocky movie ever created, we're gonna we're gonna press rewind. We're gonna go back a little bit further and we're gonna go, we're gonna go OG. We're gonna go the original. The first one, Rocky One. And so in case if you have never seen this masterpiece, let me give you a quick recap. I promise you there is a spoiler alert. So if you haven't, well, you've had like 30 years, so it's on you. Uh, So in 1975, the heavyweight boxing world champion Apollo Creed announces his plans to hold a title bout in Philadelphia during the upcoming United States Bicentennial. However, his opponent is unable to compete due to an injured hand, and with all other potential replacements booked up or otherwise unavailable, Creed decides to spice things up by giving a local contender a chance to challenge him. Creed selects Rocky Balboa, the Italian stallion, a southpaw boxer who fights primarily in small gyms and works as a collector for a loan shark. Rocky undergoes several weeks of unorthodox training, such as using sides of beef as punching bags. Rocky is later approached by Mickey Goldmill, a former bantamweight fighter who turned trainer and whose gym Rocky frequents about further training. Rocky meets Adrian, who's a girl from the local pet shop, and they soon begin dating. The night before the fight, Rocky confesses to Adrian that he does not believe that he can win but strives to go the distance against Creed, which no other fighter has ever done, in order to prove himself to everyone. The big fight between Rocky and Apollo Creed takes place on New Year's Day. Rocky knocks Apollo down in the first round, and it's the first time that Creed has ever been knocked down. Humbled and worried, Creed takes Rocky more seriously for the rest of the fight. And the fight goes for the full 15 rounds with both men sustaining various injuries. Rocky, with hits to the head and swollen eyes, he requires that his eyelid be cut in order to restore vision. Apollo, with internal bleeding and a broken rib, struggles to breathe. And as the final round bell sounds, both fighters are locked in each other's arms and they promise each other there will be no rematch. After the fight, the sportscasters and the audience go wild. Creed comes out as winner by virtue of split decision. Adrian and Rocky embrace and profess their love for each other, not caring about the outcome of the fight. 
come on, who doesn't love a good Rocky movie? There's a little bit of something for everybody. They're so good. And I love the fact that we're starting off this series with Rocky because I think that it sets up where we're going so well. Because as we mentioned, we're talking about the armor of God. Found it in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 10. It says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, we're all in a fight. It's not, it's, your fight is not against your spouse. Like that fight that you had on the way to church in the minivan with your kids going crazy in the backseat, that's not the fight that we're talking about here today. We're talking about a spiritual fight. And the, the opponent that you are fighting is far more seditious than Apollo Creed. Your opponent, his name is Satan, and his desire is to keep you from living the life that God has placed you on this planet. He's, he's trying to keep you from the destiny that God has placed on the inside of you. And so throughout this series, we want to answer the question of why it's important that we put on the armor of God. It's so that way, uh, it's so that way you can set yourself up for success in the spiritual fight of your life. The armor of God, it's not something that you put on when you think about it. It's not something that when it's convenient, all right, I'll put on the armor of God now. It's not something that you just put on one piece and then kind of wait a, a day or two and then put on another piece, but we need to continually be clothed in the full armor of God, prepared for any attack from the enemy. My favorite part of the Rocky movies are not the fights themselves, but it's the, it's, the training, uh, it's the training scenes where he's preparing for those fights, where he's getting ready, where the, the intensity picks up and he's, he's, his workouts are, are brutal and his intensity is second to none. He, man, he's training hard. His diet is disciplined. We see in, in one of the movies where he, he starts chugging raw eggs, which is absolutely disgusting. But the man is disciplined. And you see, we have to have that, that same discipline, that same intentionality in our lives in order to continually be clothed in the armor of God. So you may be wondering at this point, like, all right, we've talked about the armor of God, but what exactly is the armor of God? And I'm so glad you asked, because if you continue reading on in Ephesians chapter 6, we pick up in verse 13, which says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that way when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. So today what we want to do is we want to focus on the first piece of armor that's listed here by the author, Paul, which is the belt of truth. And now the, the belt, it seems like a weird place to start when talking about the armor of God. Like if, if I'm going to start naming off some different pieces of armor, immediately I start thinking of the helmet, I think of the shield, I think of the sword. Like those are the things that I think about. If I'm on family feud and the topic is a Roman soldier's armor, I am not listing belt as the first option. There's so many other options that I could have gone with. But as I started to research a little bit more and start to look into how a Roman soldier's uh, armor was created, we start to see that Paul was very intentional to start with the belt because that's kind of the centerpiece that everything else uh, builds upon. The, the bell is what keeps all the other armor in place. It allows him to run, allows him to, to maneuver while fighting, and it's also the place where he would have stored his, his sword, his rope, uh, money, and, and rations that all would have been held on his belt for a, a quick availability when necessary. You see, a, a Roman soldier, 
their, their belt was extremely important and they would have understood exactly what Paul was talking about and why he started with the belt of truth because everything else is dependent on that one piece. The belt of truth that we're talking about here today, it is better explained as, as a, a soldier's belt that, every, that holds everything else together. Because when, when we talk about like our belt, one of the things that our belt has, like a belt that you'd be wearing here today, it's, it's adjustable. So kind of based off of how many hot dogs you ate at your cookout here this weekend, you can adjust and you can expand the parameters of your belt. But the belt of truth, it doesn't change with what's going on around you. You can't change it to a different notch. No, this is absolute truth. It doesn't move based off of your feelings or opinions. It doesn't move based off of how much time has passed. No, this is absolute truth. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Culture is going to try to tell us that, that there is no absolute truth. That it's, it's individualistic. You know, if it's true for you, that's great, but it might not be true for me. How do we really know what truth is? But as followers of Jesus, we're actually followers of the truth. Yeah, right. Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that nobody can come to the Father except through me. So as we discuss the, the belt of truth today, I've got this, this key thought or this big idea that I want all of us to, to walk away with as we are walking out to the party in the parking lot dreaming of the hot dogs that Herb Turk has cooked up for us. May we walk away with this reminder that we need to put on the armor of God to overcome falsehood with truth. Go ahead and, and write that in your notes. Put on the armor of God to overcome falsehood with truth. You see, growing up, there was a lot of things that I believed to be true, things that I heard on the playground or, or on the bus that I just assumed was true. You know, that person is a little bit older than me, and so they must know what they're talking about. So I believed that if you ate an apple seed, that all of a sudden there was an apple tree that was growing in your stomach. I believed that brown cows produced chocolate milk. I was so upset when I learned that that was not true. I learned that cracking your knuckles does not actually cause arthritis, thank goodness. That moms don't actually have eyes on the back of their head. Sorry, mom, I did find out the truth. I learned that, that storks don't deliver babies. And that was an awkward conversation I was not prepared for. And I was so relieved to learn that we actually do not swallow seven spiders a year while we're sleeping because I was petrified of sleeping with my mouth open because I was so concerned about swallowing a spider. And see, growing up, we're convinced of all these crazy ideas and we just believe that they're true until somebody else tells us that it's actually, it's actually false. And I think, you know, some of these examples, that they're funny, but we've We've kept some falsehoods in our lives that we still believe to this day. Maybe they're not quite as, as humorous as believing that a stork delivers babies. Maybe you're, maybe you're still believing that, you know what, I'm never, gonna, I'm never gonna be able to outrun my past, that, you know what, those decisions that I've made in my past are always going to be a part of my future. Maybe you believe that you're unlovable, that you're always going to uh, remain single. Maybe you believe that you're always gonna be sick. You see, there are falsehoods in life that we just believe to be true, that we allow to kind of anchor themselves to us, and we've accepted them as truth over our lives. But today, we want to talk about overcoming those falsehoods with truth. I think step one of the process is knowing who's involved in the fight. I think we have to know who we're fighting against, because a reminder, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Yes, family, yes, friends, uh, people can drive us crazy, but our fight is not against people. Our fight, as Ephesians 6.12 says, our fight is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So if we want to kind of keep on with this, this boxing theme for today, let's look at the tale of the tape. Let's look at who's involved with this battle. And so fighting out of the falsehood corner is the father of lies. His name is Satan. His plan of attack is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's in his very character, it's in his nature to lie, to deceive, to distort the truth, and to create confusion. Because his mission 
is to have you question, can you trust God? Can you know that God is real? He has you questioning all these things. He's, que- he's having you question truth. Meanwhile, fighting in your corner is God himself. Not just the author of truth, but truth itself, because God is truth, and his word can be trusted. David Jeremiah wrote in his book, The Overcomer, he says, uh, he's talking about the armor of God, and he says that the truth is not a system. Truth is not a philosophy, it's a person. If you want to know the truth of God, you must know Christ, because he alone is truth. That's why your enemy, he tries so hard to to twist the truth and to distort the truth because he knows that God is truth. And so if he can get you to question what is absolute truth and does absolute truth really exist, then he has you questioning who God is and what God has said in his word. And he can either get you to either not believe God at all or have a warp and twisted view of who God truly is. And so if we, if we do a quick recap and kind of set ourselves up for where we're going, we know that we're in a spiritual battle, one that's between good and evil, truth and lies. And my hope is that we, that we understand that this battle is raging on around us, that it's not enough for us to have this, this rocky mentality where he confesses to Adrian that I just hope that I can last for 15 rounds with Apollo Creed and and just be standing by the end. Like, that's my goal. We can't have that mentality because if we just try to stand toe-to-toe and go swing for swing with the enemy, that is a recipe for disaster that we will be unable to overcome. Instead, we need to prepare for battle and we need to put on the belt of truth to knock out the falsehoods with truth. So as we talk about putting on the belt of truth, it is a great visual representation, but what does that practically mean for our lives? What are some practical steps that we can do in order to put on the belt of truth? It means that, number one, we need to seek truth. And my son, Corbin, he is three and a half years old, and his, his new game that he loves playing is hide and seek. And he's got, he's become proficient at seeking, which is kind of annoying because I used to be able to just like sit behind a chair and scroll Instagram for 10 minutes and everybody was happy. And he's running around the house looking for me, but now he's actually gotten good at seeking. He's he's been able to find me. He's still terrible at hiding though because he always gives away where he's going to hide. He'll say things like, daddy, that was a really good hiding spot. Now I'm gonna hide there while you count. Okay, bud. (laughs) Sounds good. I'll see you in five seconds. Uh, or he'll, he'll say things like, Daddy, go, go count in the kitchen because I'm going to hide in the living room. Like, that's, that's our games of hide and seek. And isn't it true that it, it seems like we're in this game of hide and seek with the truth? Like, we're trying to figure out where it is. And we're trying to figure out like what actually is the truth that's being spoken around us because we've got social media and and mainstream media telling us all these different things and we're trying to figure out like who's actually telling the truth because this person's saying this thing and this person's saying the opposite and this person, I don't even know what they're talking about, but everybody's saying something different and we're trying to find the truth all over the place. But it's actually not that difficult to find truth. It's not because my son Corbin gave away the hiding spot, but it's actually because God himself told us that he is truth. So we don't have to travel the world. We don't have to read encyclopedias to try to figure out where truth is. We seek truth when we seek the word of God. You see, on the, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was praying to God for his disciples. And in John 17, 17, he says this, He says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. As Jesus was praying for his disciples, he was praying that they would be led by the word of God, which is truth. He was praying that that they would get the truth on the inside of them because he knew what was coming up ahead. He knew that they were going to be persecuted. He knew that there was going to be difficult seasons in life for each of the disciples. And he was praying that they would be led by God's word. We just came out of a series called Different. And we talked all about how we as followers of Jesus, how we are to stand 
out from culture, how we are to stand on the truth that is the word of God and proclaim uh, God's truth and be light in darkness. Yes, it's countercultural, and yes, it may lead to difficult seasons here on earth, but our job as Christians is not to be comfortable, but it's to be ambassadors of God's kingdom, advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I have a, a, a few recommendations um, when, when looking to seek truth through the word of God to really help this to become something that is a, it's a habit, it's muscle memory, that when you wake up that you are seeking truth and you're seeking the word of God. And the first recommendation is this, that you set aside a time and a place. Make it something, again, that becomes a habit, that when you wake up in the morning, you know that you're grabbing your Bible, that you're going to, you know, this specific chair, and you are going to, to read the Word of God. Or maybe it's on your lunch break, where you, all right, I'm grabbing my lunch, I'm going out to the car, and I'm reading the Word of God. Another recommendation is to follow the acronym of SOAP. It's really easy to remember, and it basically sets up your, your kind of your, your devotions, your time with God. The S stands for scripture. Read a kind of a predetermined amount of scripture. What I like to do is I like to use the YouVersion app on my phone and go through the Bible in a year plan. It just helps me be consistent in reading through the Bible, not just the parts that I understand, not just the parts that I like, but the whole thing to make it all make sense together. That's, that's something that I like to do. The O stands for observation. As you read through those scriptures, what's something that you feel like God's speaking to you, something that you're taking away from the scriptures that you've read? The A stands for application. In light of that truth that you've observed in the scriptures, how's your life gonna look different? How are you going to apply that to your life and live that out on a daily basis? And then finally, P stands for prayer. Communicate with God. Bring him into your everyday life and allow him to speak to you. That's how we seek truth when we seek the word of God. As we spend time alone with God, connecting with him and his word, we're seeking truth. We're fastening on the belt of truth in our lives. So not only do we, do we seek truth, but we also need to speak truth. So we seek truth and we speak truth. When we seek truth, we actually, it should change the words that come out of our mouth. It should change the words that we speak. It changes how we speak to other people and it changes how we speak about ourselves as well. Putting on the belt of truth means that we knock out the lies and the misconceptions from our vocabulary and we replace it with the truth that is found in God's word. I think of it this way. Have you ever met somebody who, uh, who they feel like they have the truth and they're willing to share it to you whether you want to hear it or not? If you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you two examples of people who will always share their thoughts with you. The first one is somebody who does CrossFit. <laughs> if somebody does CrossFit, you will know about it in .3 seconds because they believe it like gospel truth. Man, they have found the workout that will solve all of your problems in life. If you're overweight, do CrossFit. If you have high blood pressure, do CrossFit. If you're in debt, do CrossFit. If your cat has fleas, somehow CrossFit is the solution to everything that you have going on in your life. I have never met somebody and three weeks later found out that they do CrossFit. No, like, if you meet somebody who does CrossFit, their introduction to you goes something like this, hi, I do CrossFit, my name is Jason. Like, that's just how somebody who does CrossFit, that's just how they operate. Our youth pastor, Pastor Caleb, he did CrossFit for uh, like two months, a couple months. Yeah, a while, we'll stick with that. And uh, <laughs> for that a while, uh, sermon illustrations, casual conversations in the office, it just, it revolved around CrossFit. And if CrossFit wasn't so good at injuring people, I was gonna injure Caleb, so I didn't have to hear about <laughs> CrossFit anymore. I feel like that joke was for like four people, but it landed really well with those four people, so it was good. Maybe you've never met somebody who does CrossFit. So here's, a, here's another example of somebody who you're going to hear about if they're kind of, if they feel like they have the truth, and that's somebody who's on a diet. 
If somebody's on a diet, you will hear about it. And uh, man, <laughs> what drives me crazy in the church office is that there's a bunch of people who are all on the same diet. And it's like, they're a week into their new diet and they have become an expert in the food pyramid. Like, I just, I'm just trying to eat my lunch here, people. Like, I don't need all the dietary facts about my lunch. Like, I'm good. Don't worry about it. You, you do you. Like, I don't care about your diet. Uh, I'm not going to be up here second service. Uh, <laughs> There are people who do CrossFit and there are people who do diet, uh, who, who are doing a diet, and they're so quick to share the truth that they have found with you, whether you're asking the question or not. How much more should we as Christians, followers of the truth, be quick to share the truth with a world that is hurting, that is dying, that's going to hell around us? May we learn from the CrossFitters and the dieters to share the truth with the world around us. See, our truth is far greater than functional fitness or a healthy diet. We have the truth of God himself in the form of his word that we get to share with people. And so as we seek truth, we need to be speaking the truth to the world around us. We have to be, as a committed follower of Christ, our commission, our mandate while here on this earth is to spread the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. The Bible says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So when you're, when you're strapped with the belt of truth, it's evident in the words that you speak. It's, it's evident in the witness that you share with other people, but it's also evident in the words that you speak about yourself because you can't go on preaching truth and prophesying and encouraging people and building other people up in faith based off of the word of God strapped with the belt of truth, but speaking negatively about yourself. Because absolute truth is truth for you, but it's also true for me. And so as we, as we put on the belt of truth, our speech should look a little bit different. We're no longer talking down on ourselves. Man, you're just an idiot, man. You can't figure this out. Like, you're never going to get this right. Like, it's just no good, rotten, very bad day all the time. That's the, that's the speech that we've been speaking over ourselves. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to change when we put on the belt of truth. Because as you seek the truth and as you speak the truth, you're going to start to speak the promises that are in God's word that you're a royal priesthood, that you're a chosen generation, that you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the country. You're blessed when you're coming and you're blessed when you're going. When you put on the belt of truth, hell should take notice. Hell should take notice because you're no longer forecasting what's happening in the natural, but you're praying, you're prophesying, and you're speaking the truth that's found in God's word. And although you might not see it yet, I'm holding firm to the truth that's found in God's word. And if he said it, then I'm believing it, and it's going to change me from the inside out. Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 45 says this, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from a thorn bush or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that's stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So I want to ask you here today, what are you speaking? Are you speaking truth? Does your voice sound like God's voice? And I'm, I'm not asking you, do you sound like James Earl Jones or Morgan Freeman? That's not what I'm talking about. But are the words that are coming out of your mouth, or do they align with the truth that is found in the word of God? And we have no idea if they align or not, if we don't seek God and then speak his truth. The last piece that I want to talk about here today as we put on the belt of truth is that we need to live truth. This might be the hardest one of them all. Because we try so hard to to live the perfect Instagram life where it seems like everything is put together, where everything, it just, it falls into place and everybody's always happy in my family and everything's always great. That's the, that's the life that we try to portray, and we, we kind of hold back in, in the camera reel all the, uh, all the things that, you know, didn't go according to plan. 
My family, we just got back from vacation yesterday. And, uh, you know, we posted, you know, the pictures and stuff on, on Instagram. But what we didn't post, well, we didn't post the temper tantrums in the car that, you know what, we've been in the car for three hours. Like, when are we going to be there? When can I see Nana and Papa? And when can I hang out with my cousins? We didn't post those temper tantrums. We didn't post the temper tantrums that happened in the front seat of the car. Why are these idiots driving so slow? Can we please just get there so I can... You laugh because it's true. You see, the truth is that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all have sin in our lives. We all, we all fall short. We all make mistakes. And we do ourselves a disservice when we pretend like we have it all together, when we sweep the ugly under the rug and we just pretend like it doesn't exist so that way nobody else can see it. You know the closet in your house that everything gets piled into when you get that last second text from the in-laws, hey, we're stopping by, we're in town. It's like, oh no, everything's gotta look great. And we just throw it all into the closet. Well, that's what we do so many times with our mistakes, with our faults. We just, we hide them in a dark corner and try to make sure that nobody else can see them. What was the scripture that, that we read earlier? The truth will set you free. We have to allow the light of God into those areas in our lives. First uh, John chapter one, verses five to nine says this. And this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk around in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, living the truth, it's tough because it's uncomfortable, it's vulnerable, but at the same time, it's, it's freeing, it's healing, and it's fulfilling because we're living the life that we were created to live, not shoving everything into a closet and trying to manage it all on our own strength because we were never created to live life alone. James 5.16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that way you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Would you stand with me? See, as, as one of your pastors, I just want to let you know that you're not in this fight alone. God's fighting for you but also you have a church family here in this place, joining online as well, who desires God's very best for your life, that we wanna be cheering you on, helping you in this spiritual battle that we all find ourselves in. You can't do life alone. You were never created to. You need other people in your life. That's why we encourage people to, to be a part of small groups, to join the dream team, to help out on serve day, not just so we can do some tasks, but that, so that way you can get around other people who are flowing in the same direction as you, who are going to spur you on towards love and good deeds. Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers it's against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need to stop pushing aside our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to allow them to walk with us through the difficult seasons in life. I'm not talking about just airing out your dirty laundry to anybody and everybody who will listen, but who are those people who are most trusted, your inner circle that you can tell anything to, and they will encourage you with the truth that is found in God's word. We need to continue to put on the full armor of God on a daily basis. We can't let our guard down. We need to be strapped with the belt of truth by seeking truth, by speaking truth, and by living truth. Come back in, in the, the weeks to come and you'll hear all about the other pieces of the armor. But here today, before we dismiss, I wanna give you the opportunity to respond to the message here today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna give you the, the opportunity, maybe you have never committed to follow Jesus. 
I believe that it's the greatest decision that you could possibly make with your life. And the Bible says that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. And he, here in just a moment, I'm going to ask if you would like to make that commitment. I'm going to simply ask that you raise your hand in just a moment because I want to know who I'm praying with here today. Maybe you're here and you committed to follow Jesus at one point in your life, but you kind of walked away. Maybe you were looking for truth uh, through other avenues, through other people or other religions. And, and I believe that God is speaking to some here today in the house and online. And he is saying that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That nobody comes to the Father except through me. If you're here today and you'd like to commit or recommit to following Jesus, I'm going to simply ask all across this room, would you just lift your hand to heaven? I want to pray with you. And I want to believe with you uh, as you enter into this relationship with God. If you're joining us online, you can just type a message. You can, you can do a private message or right there in the chat. We have some online hosts who would love to pray with you and give you some next, next steps. But here in the house, anybody at all, would you just lift your hand if you're saying today, I want to commit to following the truth. I want to commit to following Jesus. And then church, can we all pray together as a family? Would you just repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Today, I'm a child of God, forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate with all those who made that decision here today to follow Jesus, man? We celebrate with heaven and the angels with each of you who made that commitment to follow him. And before we, before we dismiss, before we go on, I just want to pray for each and every one of us that we would be able to to be fastened, that we'd be able to fasten that belt of truth around us, no matter what, uh, no matter what looks like around us, no matter what culture says. May we be clothed in the armor of God, fastened with the belt of truth. Can I pray for you, dear Heavenly Father? I thank you so much for each and every one who's here in the house, who's online. God, I thank you for those who are committed followers of Jesus. God, that we can put on the of God that we can that we can withstand the attacks of the enemy God I thank you for the truth that is your word and God I thank you that the truth will bring freedom and so God I pray for those who are wrestling with falsehoods in their life God I thank you that as we put on the armor of God that we'll be able to overcome those falsehoods with truth not by might not by power but heavenly father through you and you alone so God we give you all the praise all the honor that you deserve in Jesus' precious name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, go ahead and drop us a line, email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life the best is still yet to come.